Hello wonderful person, so in this video we're going to be returning to our adventures in the Asobo Studio Flight Simulator. I kept saying Microsoft, but Microsoft didn't really have anything to do with this, they just published the game. And also, I don't like Microsoft, I haven't used their products in decades, I'm not going to use their products in decades, and uh, Linux is the future. But anyway, uh, totally not related to anything I'm going to say in this video. This company created this amazing game, and just at the right time. We all need to have this feeling of travel and the feeling of wonder that we get when we travel. Because of the pandemic, most of us, if not all of us, cannot do this right now. And so like many other gamers, I've been doing this by using Flight Simulator, but my idea of travel was actually looking for locations I would never really travel to otherwise. Mostly because of the remoteness and also because it's just very expensive to get there. During this time I've discovered a lot of really cool places, but the coolest ones so far have been craters. And so in the last few videos we've been kind of diving into these craters, discovering what they look like, and learning a little bit more history and science about them. This is the next location, this is actually in Algeria, and um, this is a crater that, as you can see, has a lot of white stuff on the inside. Now, can you guess what this is? Just like in the previous crater from last video, I too thought it was some sort of a salt deposit. Possibly another location where ancient humans may have been mining salt for many many years. But the actual pictures reveal that it's just slightly lighter and much much more reflective sand. Suggesting that what we're looking at here is, well, some sort of a very very bright silica or some kind of other deposit that was created way way after the collision happened. Now this crater, as you can see, is not particularly big. It's around 500 meters in diameter and about 65 meters deep. And the size of the object that created this was only probably about 15 meters or so um, in diameter. So this was a pretty small rock, but the collision here was very high speed, which created this relatively large object in the middle of Sahara. Now, other than that, and there's really nothing else we know about it, but I'm sure there's a lot more exciting things we'll discover. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, it's not really that old either. It's about 100,000 years old, which makes this one of the youngest craters on the planet we've discovered, but obviously not the youngest one. So in that sense, it's a pretty cool place, but that's kind of all we know. Let's move on to the next one. And also the smallest crater in this video, the crater known as Monteraqui that you see right here, with the salt deposit in the middle. Now this is, now this is only about 500 meters in diameter, or about 1500 feet, and from what the scientists learned about this over the years is that it's about 100,000 years old and was also created by a relatively small rock. It was most likely only about 10 meters in diameter and the reason why it was able to create such a large crater compared to the other ones we looked at is actually because this location is at a relatively high elevation in Chile. Here the air pressure is much lower and um, well in essence this is about three and a half kilometers in altitude so the asteroid before the collision didn't have to go through as much atmosphere and thus didn't lose as much speed so the collision itself was at much higher velocity than usual it's also been suggested that the asteroid that created the crater may have actually come from a larger piece that fell apart and some of these pieces may have been discovered as far away as argentina now it hasn't really been confirmed just yet but the science the geological science are, well, somewhat strong to suggest that this is indeed what happened. And also, this was most likely created by an iron asteroid, simply because of all of the deposits we found here. This is of course more unusual because normally impact craters are made by rocky asteroids, but in this case it was a metal asteroid. And because it was more dense, it was a lot easier for this rock to go through the atmosphere and to create this impact. But other than that, that's sort of all we know about this. At least for now. Okay, the next one is going to take us back to my home country of Canada and to a location that, like most Canadians, have no idea even exists. It's probably one of the coolest scientific places in Canada, but once again, most scientists don't really know about this place either. It's known as the Devon Island. And I've discussed this uh, island when I talked about one of the incredible discoveries about Mars. Now, Devon Island is essentially known as Mars on Earth simply because of the extremely unusual conditions present here and the very strange, very peculiar climate that's all over the place here. I think the easiest way to try to imagine where this place is located is to take a look at it in Google Earth. This is the Devon Island that we're talking about. The crater itself is located right here, it's actually pretty large. The name for this location is Houghton Impact Crater and the island itself is very, very, very far north of the civilization 
that exist in Canada, which is basically right here along the border. And right now we're flying right in the middle of this crater, although it's somewhat difficult to tell that we are, but you can kind of see the circular shape that it forms. At least that's the inner part, the uplifted part. The area beyond that is a little bit different because it's actually been disturbed by all sorts of activities in this region over the millions of years. Because this crater is pretty old. It was created by a large rock that was about 2 kilometers in size, and uh, the crater itself is about 23 kilometers in size. And this happened 39 million years ago. So yeah, long, long time ago. But this area is the location for the Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station, which as I mentioned is essentially Mars on Earth. This is where for a very long time, for practically two decades now, both NASA and a lot of other agencies have been sort of role-playing and investigating what it would be like to live on Mars, to work on Mars, to do studies on Mars. Mostly because everything from geology to even climate to some extent resembles what we believe Mars to be like. And so this is once again one of the coolest places you can probably one day visit in Canada if you ever get a chance. And that way you can even tell people that you went to Mars. At least to some extent. The scientific Mars. But as most of us will probably never have a chance to get here simply because it's just way way too far away and also because well the flight alone here would probably cost several thousand dollars and unless you're a researcher you're never really going to get a chance to live here. This is where Flight Simulator makes it a little bit more realistic and we get to fly on Mars. At least to some extent. Now honestly um, exploring this area can get a little bit boring mostly because well just like on Mars the topology itself is somewhat repetitive but you get to fly inside a crater and you also get to see some locations that are not going to be found anywhere else on earth once again because of the uniqueness and the unusual climate and also unusual parameters present on this island this location is also very very unique because the weathering here happens very slowly so this crater is much more well preserved than anything else on earth at least to some extent because conditions here are almost always below freezing and also because the vegetation here doesn't really grow that fast, as you can see, there's barely any vegetation on the ground. All of this makes it for a very exciting scientific prospect to study one of the more pristine large craters on the planet. So this is actually why this location is so important to science and so important to NASA. And I personally just find it kind of relaxing to fly above this island, the Devon Island, just because it kind of looks very peaceful, very calming, and also kind of looks very ancient, very primordial, something that um, existed before life started to evolve on the planet. But yeah, unfortunately you don't get to see the outline of the crater unless, of course, you're inside the International Space Station. Okay, on that note, let's go to the next location. The very anomalous and very unusual looking object known as the Upheaval Dome located in Utah in the United States. Here I'm gonna have to use a jet plane to try to get to the higher location so we can see the outlines of this crater. You can sort of start seeing the outline from this altitude and from this angle and it's essentially that central region that kind of looks like a circle but it's very broken up and it also looks a little bit unusual which is why it's known as an anomalous structure. Now because this structure is about 170 million years old the actual crater is no longer visible and the size of the crater is supposed to be about 10 kilometers or 6 miles in diameter but we do get to see the central region the one that was uplifted by the very powerful collision with our planet. So basically this right here, this is the upheaval dome and this is exactly what you're going to see right there underneath the airplane from the altitude of about, what are we now, 30, 27,000 feet or I guess that's about 9 kilometers. So that structure right there, that's another very unusual crater formed in North America about 170 million years ago. And so this is probably one of the strangest crater formations in North America and as you can see it doesn't even have a very sort of circular shape. So the anomaly here is most likely because the crater was created by something colliding with the planet at a somewhat uh, inclined um, collision. But the actual structure itself, which once again is covered in salt as you can see, is a telltale sign of a powerful collision long... okay, time ago. Long, long time ago, as I was saying. Yeah, it's kind of difficult to fly a jet, talk, and also try not to collide with things. But anyway, we're going to the next destination, this beautiful lake located in northern Russia, and Siberia specifically. 
And um, this here is the entire lake is a very, very large crater. Also extremely interesting to scientific community. Okay, the name for this, I'm going to have trouble pronouncing, but I think it's called El Gitkidgin, which is a language, it's a Chukchi language, one of the cultures living in this region, and the name means White Lake. So overall, this doesn't really look as exciting as some of the other craters we've visited, but um, the most exciting part about this, other than this just being an extremely beautiful and very, very clean lake, is that since its creation three and a half million years ago, this lake has never been covered by glaciers. And so the bottom of this lake is covered in roughly around 400 meters of sediments from the last 3.6 million years. And this is extremely important for various studies, including, of course, climate studies. The maximum depth for this lake is about 170 meters, the rest is sediment, and the total size here is about 12 kilometers in diameter. So as you can see, this looks pretty big. Now I'm going to go back to our jet just to see what it looks like from the altitude, hopefully not crash again. And interestingly, the scientists were also very surprised to discover fish in this lake, mostly because of, well, very difficult conditions in which they're surviving here. The lake, for the most part, is almost always frozen. It sometimes gets to thaw in the summer, but very rarely. And also because this lake is relatively up north, it's mostly always in darkness. So the extreme darkness and the extreme cold conditions should not really produce that much fish. But turns out that there are at least three different types of fish here, and two types of fish are endemic, meaning that you can only find them in this lake and nowhere else in the world. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't really find the pictures for these fish, but um, I presume they look something like typical arctic char, which is a typical fish you can find in these lakes, and is also the only fish I ever succeeded in catching, ever. Like, literally ever. I only had one success in life, and this was an arctic char. From another arctic lake somewhere in North Canada. Anyway, so um, this is a pretty exciting, scientifically speaking, lake, and also crater. But other than that, it's also a very beautiful location and very, very peaceful to fly across. But because of the remoteness of this location, you're not really going to find anything else here. So anyway, let's take a look at another one, another smaller crater that's a little bit easier to see and navigate with a smaller plane. And it's the only crater we're going to visit in India. This right here is a lake and it's also a crater. This is the only crater known in the location that was famous because in this region there were really, really huge volcanoes right around the time the dinosaurs disappeared. So as you can imagine previously, this was thought to be a volcanic crater, but turns out that it's not. Turns out that it's an asteroid crater, and it's known as the Lunar Crater or the Lunar Lake. Here's a slightly different view from the opposite direction. Now unlike some of the previous lakes and craters we've taken a look at, this one is different in its composition. Unlike the pristine waters, very, very clean waters in Canada, for example, this crater seems to be almost the opposite. It's filled with different minerals and salts, and because of this, it's also filled with all sorts of life. It's not a deadly lake, it's actually a lake teeming with life. It also gained worldwide attention a few years back when, for some reason, although initially unknown reason, it turned pink and created a kind of a worldwide sensation. Turns out it was mostly because of the very, very high salinity and very low water levels that specific year, which dramatically increased the levels of Halobacters or the salt-loving bacteria, which started producing a lot of carotenoids, which is that stuff that makes carrots orange, also other fruits orange, but it also adds colors to a lot of other things around the planet. For example, these beautiful orange formations around the acidic lakes in Yellowstone and flamingos, which also turn orangey-pink as they eat all sorts of small invertebrates that in turn eat the bacteria I mentioned previously. And so this unusual compound provides colors to various life and also various structures on the planet, including this beautiful lake. Now, in terms of the creation of the lake, we believe it's anywhere from about 50,000 to maybe 500,000 years old. And um, what may have created this wasn't really that big. Because the crater is about 1 kilometer um, or about 4,000 feet in size, and it's only about 137 meters or about 450 feet deep, it means that the object here was about maybe 50 meters in size. But what's interesting is that because the object colliding with this region was actually striking rock, this is basically one of the very few locations on the planet where the impact crater is inside the basaltic rock 
from the volcanoes that were present here, it meant that the rock must have been, well, relatively dense or possibly larger in size than we originally estimated. So this was a pretty powerful collision and most likely resulted in a very, very large explosion. But because it happened a relatively long time ago, there were probably no people here to witness any of this. But because there is actually a town nearby, this is maybe one of these places you could one day visit. From what I understand, this is one of the tourist destinations um, for some of the more, um, I guess, experience-seeking tourists. And there are definitely different ways here where you can travel to this place and then see the crater for yourself. Now, I don't really know if you're allowed to swim in the lake, but chances are that you might not want to. It sounds like uh, there's a lot of stuff in the lake that might potentially make you sick. Although chances are people still do it anyway. Anyway, so that's the only crater that we're going to talk about in India. And let's go to the last crater, the last exciting crater I found, located in Namibia, Africa. And this is actually the last crater I wanted to take a look at because I haven't really found that many uh, other craters that look exciting. Also, as you might have heard from one of the previous videos, there are only about 190 craters on Earth that are known to us, and most of these are very, very large. They're very difficult to see from an airplane. But let's take a look at Rotorkam, or Red Ridge Crater as it's known. Named so because it has a red ridge. Well, not very exciting. So this crater here is about 2.5 kilometers in diameter. It's also about 137 to 140 meters deep and was most likely produced by something similar to the previous crater we explored in India. The age here though is a little bit older, it's probably around 4.8 million years old. So this is also one of the older, more preserved, um, smaller craters. And one of the reasons I wanted to visit this is because the real shots of this crater from the airplane look very very cool. They do make this look like a very peaceful and very beautiful location. But luckily in Flight Simulator this looks almost just as good. Main difference, of course, being that you can also do this in the flight simulator and you probably wouldn't be doing this in real life. So here we can fly really, really close to the rim, we can also fly really close to the ground and actually see what the ground looks like. And although overall not a super exciting crater, at least in terms of the visual representation and also in terms of what's around it, it still is an interesting scientific crater, simply because of what created it and how it was created. Turns out, nothing was left after the explosion that was responsible for creating all of this, and essentially nothing was ever recovered in terms of the actual pieces of asteroid. So this is very unusual, especially because this was a very powerful explosion, very powerful collision. Here it was uh, to the point where it reached deep into the ground itself, releasing some of the larger deposits from underneath the ground that normally only get released when very large asteroids collide with the planet. So whatever hit this location, even though it was relatively small, it was an extremely powerful collision. Probably because the object was moving really really fast. But anyway, on that note, that's kind of all I wanted to cover in this very short series of exploration of Earth videos. And these are the craters I wanted to cover. Now if I did mention a crater that you know of, something else that's really incredible, something that's worth visiting, let me know in the description or send me an email. But for now, I guess I'm going to keep flying, keep trying to explore the world, even though I wish I was doing this in real life, and hopefully I'll discover something else incredible that I'm going to share with you in some of the future videos. On that note, check out some of the other videos on science, space, and other types of exploration, and subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and even planet Earth, and also come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. Maybe consider supporting this channel on Patreon or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description below. And most importantly, come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known. On that note, I'm going to go and explore our planet a little bit more, hopefully not collide too much, and possibly discover something else really, really cool. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye. Now you may have noticed that I've been kind of colliding a lot while creating these videos. That's mostly because my camera is like right there, but I have to look at the screen right here to try to see what I'm doing. Also, I'm playing with a gamepad. Like, who flies an airplane with a gamepad, right? Anyway, I'm still gonna keep doing this because it's fun. I'm not doing this for realism purposes or to try to impress people with my landing skills, which are completely non-existent, but I'm really just doing this to explore our beautiful planet.